I am kind of taking a pretty, um, pretty, t pretty kind of theoretical tack here, uh, based on a book that I hope will be forthcoming, slightly delayed in uh, 2020, called "The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems." I um, kind of take as my icon, my central image, this poster from Occupy Wall Street in 2011. Um, it's just, just something about it I like. I, I, it's something about the woman who's balanced on the back of the, that's the bull of Wall Street, the sculpture in, in downtown uh, New York City. And there's just something about the way she's, um, she's riding the bull um, and in a sense taming the bull that I think kind of speaks to the themes that I'm gonna address. You know, in some ways what I'm gonna talk about is um, maybe a little, I don't know, sobering in its attention to social division and social conflict, but it's also optimistic in its uh, sense that um, actually uh, we've seen a lot of progress in gender equality um, in um, the recent historical period. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're gonna see more. I know this is not inevitable and it's, it, it's totally possible that uh, the decline of the patriarchal system could be temporary and it could rise again. Uh, but hopefully after listening, listening to what I have to say, um, you'll, be, um, you'll be heartened and more willing to make sure that doesn't happen. So, um, feminist theory and efforts to understand patriarchy are really motivated by a desire to understand gender inequality. But that's not all there is. Uh, there's something much bigger embedded in the theoretical project. And I guess my, um, my hope is that uh, looking at the history of, of uh, patriarchal institutions can help us understand something really important about social conflict uh, and about the complexity of conflict space, not just on gender, but also on class, on race, ethnicity, on, on national citizenship, and many other dimensions of, of collective identity. And that's what this word intersectional intends to convey. Uh, the idea that um, we inhabit a world where a lot of different forms of inequality intersect and affect us in, in a in complicated ways, um, both intersecting and overlapping. So I'm gonna tackle this by asking three uh, pretty straightforward questions. And believe me, I'm not gonna be able to give you a complete answer uh, to end all um, questions about these, but I, I just wanna um, show you how these fit together. Number one, why do women experience economic disadvantage? Number two, how can collective power structures such as those based on patriarchal institutions best be conceptualized? And number three, why do patriarchal power structures emerge and how do they evolve? So let's go first to this economic disadvantage point. Um, what I mean by economic disadvantage is that uh, Women are more susceptible to poverty than men in the US and other countries. They have less wealth than men in the US and other countries. But I'm gonna focus here on the labor market and the fact that women's earnings are generally less than men's in labor markets, even when we control for differences in their education, in their educational attainment, uh, their experience, and other characteristics that we think would affect earnings. So the way economists uh, broach the subject of of uh, earnings inequality is with this classic analysis of supply and demand. So there's uh, a group of people called women, they supply their labor market. The greater the wage that's offered, the more labor they'll offer to the market. That's the green upward sloping line. Then there's a demand uh, for women. It's downward sloping, the higher the price uh, of the uh, 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 wage, the, the uh, lower the demand for women workers. So where supply equals demand, we have an equilibrium wage, and that presumably helps explain outcomes that we actually see in the labor market. And 
I think this is a useful diagram. It, it does help explain uh, wage inequality. And I think the, the best way to illustrate it is to think about shifts in the curves. So it could be that women have, uh, just simply have different preferences than men do. And so uh, their, their supply uh, to the market shifts downward and to the right. It's lower than that of men. They're less willing to work long hours in paid employment, uh, or they uh, uh, prefer to specialize in family work to some extent. I think there's some truth to that. It's also true that employers often discriminate against women, or they uh, certainly have in the past. Uh, and what that suggests is that they, there's less demand for women's labor, labor, so that red curve kind of shifts down, uh, leading to a lower equilibrium wage. Uh, I guess my, my criticism of this supply and demand framework isn't that it's incorrect, but that it's really incomplete. Because the interaction of supply and demand is a lot more complicated than this graph implies. So first of all, I think people are smarter than the diagram uh, assumes. It, it's not that there's a supply curve that's independent of the demand curve. People supply stuff to the labor market based on what we, they think employers are gonna demand. And employers demand things partly based on what they think workers might be willing uh, to supply. And so there's some, um, Planning for the future also is very difficult. You don't know, like, you're thinking about what are you going to major in? Well, does that depend on the demand for a particular type of work this year, next year, five years from now, 10 years from now? There's a lot of uncertainty in the real world that's not, not captured by that diagram. And in addition to uncertainty, there's a lot of imperfect information in this world. And there's also a lot of statistical discrimination. Uh, by um, Imperfect information, I mean that when an employer sets about to hire a worker, that employer has no way of knowing if that worker is going to uh, be a committed uh, long-term worker who's willing to commit to the firm for a long period of time, and is therefore tending to make guesses based on the experience of people who are like that person and the way they've behaved in the past. That's what we mean by statistical discrimination. And unfortunately, statistical discrimination has a self-reinforcing quality. If you think that women are going to be less reliable long-term workers, you're less likely to hire them, then women are going to continue to be <laughs> tempted to be very part-time workers, which is going to reinforce um, that whole process over time. So um, uh, another, uh, another example of the, of the kind of uh, information dynamics is that employers in most states today have the right to ask job applicants, what did you earn in your last job? Well, a woman being asked that question is in a difficult position because if she declines to answer, the employer is probably gonna mark her down. If she does answer, it's likely that she earned less than men did in that job. So that employer is going to be kind of stupid if he or she doesn't offer her a wage that's only slightly above what she earned in her last job. And that's an example of of a kind of information dynamic that can reproduce wage inequality. In my home state of Massachusetts, by the way, it's now illegal to ask applicants what they earned in their last job. And that's partly an effort to break this cycle of uh, kind of self-reinforcing inequality. But there's a third element that's, that's really important that I think economists underestimate, and that's the role of social institutions in determining the shape and the slope of the supply and demand curves. And I'm going to um, concentrate on three different categories of institutions that I think are relevant to inequalities, not just based on gender, but also age and sexuality. But I'm going to focus on the gender angle here. So first, there are political institutions. There are laws and public policies uh, that restrict or fail to enforce individual rights. So in the past, we've seen laws that have uh, literally discriminated overtly against women. There are very few of those in the US today, but there are still many laws and policies that don't really effectively enforce women's rights. Women's rights to protection against sexual harassment, um, women's rights to fair treatment, women's rights to uh, effective enforcement of the child support responsibilities of absent parents. I think when we look at, at political institutions, it's important not to just look at what they don't 
what they, the ways in which they constrain women, but also the ways in which they don't constrain men uh, in ways that contribute to gender inequality. Secondly, I think ideological institutions are really important. And by that, I mean perceptions, norms, and preferences that channel women into activities that limit their independence and bargaining power and exert a very, very powerful role independently of political institutions. And then finally, there are economic institutions, gender differences in access to resources, financial capital, human capital, and or control over the products of their labor. A lot of the work women do does not allow them to control the products of their labor, namely children, or to capitalize or gain any kind of economic reward for that activity. And that um, difficulty in controlling the product of labor is also characteristic of a lot of care work that's performed uh, for pay, although it's not quite as literal in that instance. And in general, you'll see in my analysis that attention to reproductive work and unpaid work plays a really central role in this uh, 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 it, it, uh, analysis of institutional effects. But let me give you some examples just to clarify what, I'm, what I mean. Until the mid-19th century, Anglo-American common law gave husbands the right to control their wives' property and their wives' labor, um, both their productive work, their earnings, and their unpaid work in the home, and also control over the labor of their minor children. In return, fathers were required to provide wives and children with subsistence, not an equal share of family income or consumption. So the notion that this is a, was a partnership is really belied by the contractual elements of it, which were quite asymmetric. And um, uh, I think uh, an often neglected dimension of uh, feminist collective action in the 19th century was it was a very concerted effort to change family law to give wife the wife uh, a legal right to one half her husband's earnings. It was never successful. And um, uh, today we have. Uh, a different regime of family law that recognizes the mutual right to mutual support. Husbands have a right to support, have an obligation to support wives and wives to support husbands. And we also have rules about the partition of wealth in the uh, event of divorce, but we don't really have explicit rules about control over the market income of one of our partners. So people can, and, and, and sometimes married couples do, keep their uh, earnings completely separate um, and, and independent. Patriarchal ideology, the general social survey has for many years asked the following question, not only in the US, but in many other countries. It, I, I don't know if you've ever been surveyed or if you've ever heard this question, uh, but I hope you'll, you'll look at the wording and, and, and reflect a little bit on the wording of the question as well as the answer you might give to it, okay? It is much better for everyone involved if the man is the achiever outside the home and the woman takes care of the home and family. How would you deconstruct the, the meaning or the implication of that sentence? Well, to me, what stands out is the idea, it's better for everyone, but it might be better for some than for others. Uh, but really what, what really offends me here is the idea that taking care of home and family is not an achievement. And I think that's very indicative of a, a a, a kind of larger devaluation of, of care work as something that is somehow natural or moral uh, and outlying outside of the economic realm of achievement and, and just reward. So um, how many people do you think agreed or strongly agreed with this statement in 2016? 27% of, of respondents in the US agreed or strongly agreed Sometimes I'm standing in that line in the airport and I'm looking at that. <laughs> okay, which one of you, which ones of you are actually agreeing with that? Uh, I don't really know, but uh, it, it, is a ge it is geographically uh, um, somewhat variable and agreement and strong agreement is strongest in the deep south uh, and weaker in the northern uh, portions of the country. And um, by the way, there's some really interesting econometric research that shows that women who are born in states like those in the Deep South where these attitudes are strongly held 
earn less money controlling for all of their characteristics, even if they move to New York City along with their counterparts. So it has kind of a long lasting um, and very tangible economic impact. It's not just a way of interpreting the world. It really has, it's very consequential. So uh, now to turn to this sort of the economic institution, the, 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 the specialization in care provision. In the US today, and I think there's now a, a pretty general appreciation of this pattern, or at least more than there used to be, most of the difference in men's and women's earnings, and I mean the difference explained, that's not explained by differences in, in their education or their experience or their or other personal characteristics, most of it comes from two things. First of all, women devote more time and energy to unpaid family care, and that tends to reduce the number of hours they supply to the labor market with consequences for their uh, experience and firm-specific skills um, that uh, lead employers to pay them less. And secondly, women are overrepresented in jobs that involve caring for others. I'm talking about occupations like teaching, like nursing, child care, elder care. Uh, these jobs are, are uh, significantly underpaid relative to other occupations requiring with the same requirements. And it's also true, and I think this is even more striking, that women who are employed in, in care industries um, which I basically define as health, education, and social services are paid less than workers in other industries, controlling for their personal characteristics and controlling for their occupation. And this is particularly true of professionals and managers pay a big penalty for moving, for, for, for working in, in um, paid care jobs where the output is somebody else's capabilities, their health or their, or their uh, um, uh, skills rather than something that they can you can actually hold on to and and um, retain ownership of and this specialization in care provision is very consequential because it reduces women's access to economic resources so while it's publicly very valuable in fact I don't think society could um, could reproduce itself at all without that uh, uh, commitment on the part of women uh, to care work uh, investments in other people often come at the expense of investments in oneself. So people talk about investments in human capital. Well, it's one thing to invest in your own education, but guess what? If you invest in your children's education, uh, that does not leave you better off economically. In fact, it's, it's quite a costly uh, undertaking. And as we know, women take more financial responsibility than men for the, for the support uh, of children in a world in which a very high percentage of children are born out of wedlock and the divorce rate is, remains close to, to 50%. There's also an emotional dimension to the vulnerability of care work. Um, bargaining power comes from the threat of withdrawing services. But if you're providing services out of a sense of concern or obligation, you're not really able uh, to make a credible threat or at least your ability to do so is at least somewhat hampered. And uh, you know, there's a million rock music uh, lyrics that refer to prisoners of love, chains, 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 et cetera, et cetera. But the real prisoners of love are not romantic partners, really, but people who uh, uh, feel a really precious commitment to dependents who can't care for themselves and are not willing to abandon them uh, no, no, matter, uh, no matter what. So the, the bottom line is it's really difficult to capture the returns from long-term investments that primarily benefit other people and pay off in the future. They have a public good quality. Uh, that is, their social value is a lot higher than their private value. And that disjuncture ends up being um, very costly for women. So um, kind of the, the, the summary of this point is that, of this section, is that patriarchal uh, institutions, political, ideological, economic institutions, operate in concert as a kind of collective power structure and it creates and reinforces inequalities based on gender, also age, and sexuality. But this is obviously not the only collective power structure that shapes our lives. And so to make it, you know, um, to make it convincing, I think we need to provide a parallel explanation, a consistent explanation of other structures of collective power. And that's what I want to turn to next. 
So I'm looking at collective power structures as constellations of institutions. They're, they're created by individual choices and by collective action, and they're incarnated or embodied in the three types of institutions that I've, I've described uh, above. They don't uh, eliminate the role of individual choice or individual agents. They just constrain the space. The, they just make the choice set available to individuals smaller, uh, okay? And one way to think about this is in terms of a, a simple bargaining model. And if you're interested, after, I'm, after I've gotten through my slides, if you wanna get into the nitty gritty of a Nash bargaining model and the distribution of gains from cooperation based on differential fallback positions, I'm happy to go there. But for now, I'm just gonna say that institutions shape the bargaining power of groups and individuals that, that belong to them, okay? And in technical terms, um, uh, this is kind of a, uh, uh, a little bit of a lesson in cooperative game theory uh, where individuals are part of groups and groups are engaging with negotiation and bargaining with one another. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that people like sit down at a table and you know, men and women don't sit down at a table and say, okay, who's gonna get what? I mean, yeah, it happens in households sometimes, who's gonna take out the garbage? But uh, a lot of collective bargaining over gender roles is very implicit and very diffuse and kind of cultural. Like you can see it in a lot of popular culture in, in treatments of gender roles that are a little bit transgressive or kind of violating the norm. And the way norms change over time is by uh, women asserting more bargaining power about how they're, you know, how they should be treated and, and what kind of rules should govern interactions between men and women. And the Me Too movement is a really good example of that. It's, it's, based, it's not just about individual, don't touch me. It's about, hey, together we're gonna change the rules about touching because the ways these have operated in the past have really worked to our, our systematic uh, uh, disadvantage. So, um, but obviously it's not just men more men and women. You know, we, in, we inhabit a lot of different groups simultaneously. Uh, and to understand or to categorize institutions according to their group effects, we have to ask some difficult questions about who benefits more from this institution. Do men benefit more than women? Do old people benefit more than the young? Do straight people benefit more than gay people? Do whites benefit more than people of color? Do citizens of the US benefit more than citizens of other countries, et cetera, et cetera? So uh, this does not imply that all these group memberships are equally important. No, but it also, it, it also uh, insists that they might all be important at some point in time and that their importance may vary according to perceptions of how other people are acting on their group identity. So if you see a lot of women out there organizing collectively around something that benefits women as a group, you might be more likely to identify with that group and wanna, uh, wanna, wanna weigh in. Whereas if you see very, very few other, very few people um, signaling their attention to their class interests uh, you may think, well, kind of that's kind of nobody's really interested in arguing about class, and so I'm not going to, I'm not very identified uh, with class. Likewise, national citizenship, racial, ethnic identity. That this is a, a, a kind of turbulent mix of of, of possible uh, strategic alternatives, all of which are mediated by the specific characteristics of the individuals and and the ways they understand their membership in these groups, or. Rather than group, group is kind of, an, you know, kind of a colorless word. Another way to think about it is teams. We all belong to teams. We all belong to a lot of different teams. But which team are we playing with? And which team are we really investing in at one point in time? Well, it kind of depends on how we like the team and how well the team is doing and what the team's chances of success are. And as those things change, our collective allegiances may, may, um, may be modified. So, <coughs> Uh, I think these uh, structures of collective power create distinct but somewhat parallel hierarchies. Uh, individuals kind of intersect these different hierarchies at, at different points, and they're synergistic. They influence one another in very complex ways. And um, one implication of this complexity is a lot of strategic dilemmas. And honestly, I think these strategic dilemmas help explain the political chaos that um, 
I see uh, around the globe, not just in the US today, because I think what's happened is we've seen some shifts in collective identity and interest that we don't really understand and are only beginning to kind of renegotiate. So a lot of people experience disadvantage in one, uh, according to one team membership, but advantage in another. So I would call that a contradictory location. And that contradictory location makes it very difficult to, to decide who you're gonna, you know, who you're gonna side with, what weight, wh where you're gonna throw your weight. Furthermore, it's often really hard to assess the costs and benefits of your strategic decisions because it often depends on the simultaneous decisions of others, right? Am I gonna support this candidate? Well, I don't know, it depends. Are other people gonna support this candidate? Because I don't wanna support a candidate that nobody else is gonna support. That's an example of what I mean by a strategic dilemma. So if everybody decides, if you just tell everybody that you shouldn't choose this person because this person has very few chances of being elected, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. That person will not have a chance because everybody has decided that nobody else is gonna vote for that person. So uh, I think this, the difficulty of, of applying a kind of rational cost-benefit analysis helps explain why group identity is really important. Some of us just stick with our teams no matter what, even if we know they're gonna fail, uh, whatever their chances are. And I think really like the way fans are for, for sports teams is a perfect metaphor for this. You know, sometimes we, we just, we're just loyal to, to them because you know, we are, uh, and uh, that loyalty may be eroded by uh, 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 the way things shake out, or or it may be kind of st uh, strengthened by it. Um, and I and and the stories that we tell, the stories that journalists tell, or that economists tell, or that political scientists tell, whatever they say about what's going on can be very influential because people have such a hard time making sense of where their interests lie that they're, they're really attracted to a strong, simple story uh, that, that, that makes really um, beautiful promises uh, in something that they wanna believe in. Um, and I think this complexity also helps explain, and this is really important, why uh, sticking to your ideals and your moral principles is absolutely crucial to making, I mean, of course, not everybody has to, and not, and very, actually, a lot of people don't. But if some people weren't sort of sticking to their ethical commitments and doing what they thought was right, even if they thought it was going to be a losing proposition, we would really be in serious trouble. So I guess my point is that there, yeah, ethical commitments, um, along with theoretical narratives, are really kind of a crucial solution to a coordination problem in human society that would otherwise be very difficult to solve. And here's a dimension of the coordination problem that I think is particularly interesting and, and, and really relevant to thinking about political economy. I call it the pie question. So which would you rather have, a small slice of a big pie or a big slice of a small pie? Well, if you're mathematically minded, you could figure out the area of the wedges there and just ask, which wedge is bigger? I'm gonna go for the biggest wedge. But remember what I said, you can't really measure it. You don't really know how big that wedge is gonna be. So you're just kind of making a guess. Well, a small slice of a big pie is something that you might get if you promote economic growth. When economists talk about Pareto efficiency, they're talking about a change that just makes the pie bigger so you can make one group better off without making the other group worse off. And actually, it's a very powerful idea because you can talk a lot of people into the idea of a bigger pie, especially if everybody wants pie, which in this case, of course, is not really pie, but money. Uh, but don't forget that sometimes you might actually be better off with a big slice of a small pie. So feudal lords in Europe blocked economic development because they knew it would reduce the size of their pie. They like were perfectly happy with their castles and their horses and their and their armor, and they didn't really care about getting, you know, they they wanted to keep their big slice. 
slave owners in the American South. This was an economic system that was not going to promote economic development, that prohibited the education of uh, a large share of the population, that lowered the potential for economic growth, but those plantation owners had a big wedge of a small pie and they were willing to die and make other people die in, in defense of it. So in my view, a lot of economic history is about this dialectic between efficiency and distributional conflict. And if you want to get people to give you a bigger slice of the pie, it's definitely advantageous to, to persuade them that you're going to make the pie bigger so that they're not going to get less. So in human society, it's pretty clear that group cooperation is very advantageous. And in fact, a lot of the technological <laughs> improvements that we've uh, witnessed um, in our history as a species and hopefully will continue to enjoy, um, if we can get a, our head around some of the problems that we're facing, cooperating, right, is that um, whatever we can do to kind of work together um, whether that involves uh, specialization and coordination and reducing conflict, is, is very advantageous. But it's very, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it's difficult to get people to cooperate. Uh, because especially in a big group, people sense that they can uh, take a nap uh, and let everybody else stay awake or come to a study group and uh, not having done any of the actual uh, homework and just free ride on the benefits of others. And so most social institutions rely to some extent on some level of discipline to enforce cooperation. And the army is a really good example, but I am a good example as a teacher. Like if you don't stay awake and you don't get your work done, you're not going to get a passing grade. That's what we call discipline. And it it's basically an effort to coordinate uh, a, a collaborative effort that will pay off uh, uh, for everybody. The problem is that uh, in trying to minimize free rider problems, you put people in authority, and once you put people in authority, the opposite problem happens. They become top riders. They use that authority to discipline you to basically skim the cream off the top, to take advantage of you and exploit you in one way or another. And uh, the challenge for human institutions is how do you have discipline without creating uh, a hierarchy that uh, that leads to exploitation and the domination of one group or another, and that's what democratic institutions are basically dissolved uh, are basically designed uh, to solve. Not that they always solve them very well, not that they're very successful, uh, but that uh, democratic institutions are in the process of evolving and hopefully evolving in the in, in better and better ways that allow us to solve these two opposing problems. So let's go back to the kind of historical question. Why do patriarchal power structures emerge and evolve over time? And I'm going to give you a, just a very simplistic kind of bullet point uh, hypothesis here that I developed in more detail in, in, in my book. And I don't think it can ever be a completely conclusive argument because we don't have a very clear historical record. But I think it suggests a line of reasoning that is, is really useful to go down. In early human history, population growth contributed to group success. And uh, this is true even among hunter-gatherer societies, that when they were in close contact with other tribes competing with them for territory, they often engaged in pretty violent group conflict uh, and behavior. And the, the, uh, the more fighters in the group, the greater the potential to defend or attack uh, other groups. Also, having more people within a larger population for much of human history uh, was uh, associated with more output. Labor-intensive technologies meant that the more people you had, uh, the more stuff you could produce, the more stuff you could produce, the more people you could raise, the bigger you could be. And military strength, um, in turn could increase economic power, and economic power could increase military strength. Now, there are a lot of alternative theories of how uh, some societies become more powerful than others, and one that you may have read or heard about is Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. And Diamond basically argues it's kind of geographical accident that some people were in areas 
that for various reasons made it e climatically and, and um, otherwise made it easier for them to grow valuable crops and domesticate valuable animals. I, I'm sure that did play an important historical role, but I think it's social institutions and innovation in social institutions that uh, plays a key role in the success of some groups at the expense of others. And um, I think patriarchal power structures played a role in uh, increasing population growth and working to the advantage of the groups uh, in which they were adopted. And one could argue that they increased the size of the pie, total size of the pie for those groups. So these, uh, I'm talking here about uh, processes like the enslavement of women from vanquished, vanquished groups, very much embedded in the history of uh, the Old Testament and also in the uh, uh, Greek uh, history of the, of the Trojan War, a history of coercive pro pronatalism and forced specialization. Gerda Lerner's book, The Origin of Patriarchy, gives a lot of great example of that. Um, forcing women uh, to specialize in the care of dependents and restricting their, their access to other jobs basically renders care for dependents quite cheap um, because uh, uh, half the population doesn't really have to uh, participate in it. But patriarchal power structures also had uh, some positive aspects that they provided pretty strong economic incentives for men to support families because they, the, the control they exercised over women and children gave them an economic incentive to, uh, uh, to support them and in fact to have uh, large, uh, large families. So the process of economic development tends to reduce the payoff to patriarchal power structures and it does so partly because the quality of human population becomes more important than the quantity of the population and differences in the physical endowments of men and women become less important. Um, uh, you know, uh, w uh, men don't have any physical advantage in work that doesn't involve upper body strength. Uh, even in the military arena, uh, soldiers have been largely displaced by uh, military drones. Uh, a five foot two, uh, hundred pound uh, woman can uh, uh, pilot a drone just as easily as a six foot five, 250 pound guy. So that's just an example of kind of the, the reality of technical change. Women have gained bargaining power as a result of this reduced specialization in activities that uh, may, rendered them dependent in the short run on men. And also we've seen the evolution of, of very different structures of inequality based on class, on race, ethnicity, on citizenship. And these become kind of in their intersectionality with gender have a destabilizing effect. So a woman becomes queen of England. Uh, because there's no male heir, and that kind of class power and privilege undermines the uh, uh, idea of um, uh, male, su male superiority or male authority um, in, in society as a whole. So yes, there are definitely pressures, uh, I think, uh, working to the advantage of women in this larger process of technical change. But there's still resistance to change because there's still a share of the pie that men would like to maintain, even if the pie is growing, right? And they're, it's really hard for them to figure out how fast the, the uh, pie is growing and whether the slice of the pie is actually as big as they think it is. So I would say that men and employers still derive some benefits from gender inequality, and women continue to bear a disproportionate share of the costs of caring for dependents and the process of social reproduction. So it's diminished, but it's still, I think it's still significant. And I would say right now, it's actually this, this resistance is playing a big part in what I identify as a process of conservative realignment that appeals to dominant national and racial ethnic interests, partly through a reassertion of male authority and patriarchal leadership, and partly by promising a bigger pie. And um, I'm just going to give you my favorite Donald Trump quote uh, from a political rally he held before he was elected in Louisiana that is, is quoted in a, a really great book by Arlie Hochschild called Strangers in Their Own Land. Trump said, I've been greedy. 
I've been a greedy, greedy, greedy businessman, and now I'm going to be greedy for the US. Okay. Join the team, join, join Team USA. Team USA is gonna, it's gonna maintain your share of the pie and it's gonna grow the pie. Um, in my view, a false promise. One of the really underestimated aspects of inequality in the global, uh, in, 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 uh, around the globe is a dimension that has nothing to do with race. Well, it has a lot to do with race, ethnicity, uh, and gender, but it's, uh, I think, especially, especially shocking and, and, and uh, conspicuous as a dimension of class inequality. So the eight richest people in the world own as much net wealth as the bottom half of the global population. That's like something out of a science fiction movie, really, uh, if you think about it. That's way, way more inequality than we ever saw under feudalism or under slavery uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, just the magnitude of differences in, in standard of living. And I don't think it's an accident that all of those eight richest people are white men and six of them are from the US. Uh, because the history of privileges based on those dimensions of inequality has shaped access to class and also solidarities based on nationality and race, ethnicity and gender have helped kind of obscure and smooth over the, the class differences that are uh, increasingly salient on a global level. So uh, I guess, you know, what I'm describing is a Actually, I'm, I'm conceding the importance of a phrase that people might, like me, used to laugh at called trickle down. Have you ever heard this phrase, trickle down? You know, wealth, you know, let the rich people, let rich people earn more because it'll all trickle down. Well, in fact, I think there is some trickle down. And I think the trickling down of different forms of privilege and advantage is exactly what makes it difficult to mobilize people around one dimension of their collective identity. So. This is really, you can really see this in the history of feminism, especially in the US, because feminism has had very uneven effects. Um, tremendous improvements for highly educated women, improved access to professional and managerial jobs, but very, very uneven benefits uh, for women who are not highly educated and don't have the opportunities for high wage employment. Also, Ability to outsource domestic responsibilities. High wage women can reduce their own care responsibilities by hiring low wage women. And in fact, their ability to do so serves as a disincentive to support the kinds of public policies that could encourage a more equal distribution of the costs of, of reproducing ourselves. And finally, persistent racial ethnic uh, differences that um, are just very evident in the, in the uh, uh, political landscape that we inhabit. At the same time, I want to emphasize that I think gender identity remains pretty strong um, because there are a lot of issues that cross class and cross race and even cross citizenship, things like reproductive rights, protection for sexual assault, uh, <clears throat> harassment. These are, these are very, these cut across uh, some of those other dimensions. And in the US, we see a big and increasing gender gap in polls and voting patterns. In fact, the 2016 elections, the, the gender gap was bigger. It was more than 20% difference between the Republicans and Democrats who were men, percentage of Republicans and uh, who were, uh, you know what I mean, uh, uh, propensity to support Republicans and Democrats, the different, total difference, 20% bigger than any year since 1972, which was the first year that this polling data was, was collected. And a lot of concern today uh, in the US uh, among employers as well as uh, workers about work family stress and uh, a transition to below replacement fertility rates. And I, I think these are all kind of a basis for a kind of uh, a coalition. But the, any kind of feminist coalition, in order to be successful, has to recognize the importance of other collective identities and interests. And it has to articulate principles of fair play and economic justice, not just for women versus men, but for men and for citizens of the US versus people from other countries and from 
you know, along every dimension of, of, of di diversity and to see equal opportunity um, as a, 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 a very important principle, uh, vital to the functioning of democracy that is much more than just absence of discrimination, but also involves protected equal access to health, education, and social services. And basically, I don't think that we can create a sustainable economy, an economy that's socially sustainable or uh, environmentally sustainable, unless we figure out better ways to protect and reward the provision of public goods and services whose social value is greater than their uh, uh, private uh, remuneration. And in closing, I want to go back to the bull of Wall Street and show you, perhaps you've seen her, a sculpture that was placed in front of that bull um, for a few months, uh, a couple of summers ago. Uh, she was uh, kind of uh, dissed by some because uh, she was, I think, the, the payment for the uh, the payment for the uh, sculpture itself came from some high high tech upscale financial consulting firm, and so a lot of progressives kind of scoffed at it. But I really love it, and as the mayor of New York City put it, I think this little girl kind of represents a spirit of defiance uh, against. Um, uh, a, uh, a big, ugly animal that's kind of running amok and uh, really needs uh, really needs a woman on its back, making it uh, making it making it behave. Thank you. <laughs>